All right, good morning. Welcome to today's presentation, ILM 310-302-0, Positive Displacement Meters. Uh, nice, uh, short little presentation today, just over 30 slides. Um, nothing too obtuse here, nothing too mind-blowing here. Um, basic understanding of positive displacement meters. So uh, we'll look at a few different types, uh, objective-wise, uh, similar for all of them. So we'll look at principles, applications for positive displacement meters, components, installation, maintenance, calibration, and then advantages and limitations of positive displacement meters. So pretty straightforward uh, objectives today. So we're gonna look at a couple of different uh, groups, I guess. First, we'll look at PD meters, uh, several different types of uh, liquid PD meters, and then we'll look at several different types of gas PD meters, and you'll see that some of them cross over between uh, liquid and gas, some do not. Um, big difference, I guess, between liquid PD meters and gas PD meters as we move forward uh, deals with the, the physical properties of, of the fluids themselves, uh, liquids, bigger molecules, uh, gases, smaller molecules, um, liquids provide lubrication, gases do not provide lubrication. So when we're discussing PD meters in the big picture, uh, gas provers will have tighter tolerances uh, and more wear, whereas liquid PD meters will have a little bit looser tolerances and be a little bit less susceptible to wear. So let's see what types of devices that we're going to look at here. So on the liquid side, we have a mutating disc pretty interesting. Uh, rotating vein, pretty common style uh, pump sort of format. Reciprocating piston, same kind of deal. Rotating lobe, like a blower on a, a car. Then on the gas side, we have a liquid sealed drum, uh, which basically takes a rotating vein and puts it into a sealed container. Uh, rotating lobe, which is the same in operating principle as the liquid version. Uh, the bellows meter, uh, everyone's got one of these hanging on the side of your house. This is a common uh, uh, orientation or design for gas meters, uh, commercial gas meters or residential gas meters, and also rotating beam, which you see, uh, again, similar in technology to the liquid version. Flow measurements taken from PD meters are always at flowing or line conditions. So a couple of key points again, I guess, about PD meters. Uh, most PD meters are powered by the flow, meaning that they don't require any electricity or anything from the outside. Uh, if there's flow, the meter is going to turn uh, and it's going to measure things. If there's no flow, uh, the meter is not going to turn and it's not going to measure anything. So it uses the uh, flowing conditions in order to make the the mechanisms operate uh, regardless of its liquid uh, or a gas turbine meter. So the PD meter in general operating principles, uh, we've got kind of a rotating lobe picture up here on the screen, but it works. Uh, the theory behind all of the different meters is the same uh, in that a PD meter traps a fixed volume and transfers it from the inlet side to the outlet side. Uh, we count the number of packages uh, as it goes through the machine and this is a measure of volumetric flow. So it's uh, it's basically just capturing a, a known volume, so a trap volume like this, and moving it from the inlet to the outlet. We know this, we know this volume, and we count the number of turns, and it is in turn multiplied by the trapped volume, and we can get volumetric flow to there. So pretty simple uh, principles of, of operation for positive displacement meters. Okay, so to measure the volume, um, or uh, measure the volume or the fluid, uh, the flow stream is mechanically broken down into discrete volumes. So regardless of the type of pump or meter that we're looking at, uh, it's it's all gonna it's all gonna break the flow into little individual bite-sized pieces, and it's gonna count uh, it's gonna count those bites, and it's gonna hopefully at the end equal the total volume of fluid that has flowed through it. Um, positive displacement meters, due to their nature and, and having these individual packets of volume, are often used when accurate quantities uh, need to be delivered, and that's why you'll see uh, lots of these types of devices on uh, residential water meters, uh, residential gas meters, um, as well as industrial applications as well. 
So PD meters uh, come in a variety of styles. Some are rotary, some are pistons, and some are bellows. So I put kind of an example of uh, the three different uh, ones that we kind of look at in the ILM here on the bottom left. Uh, a piston, a piston style uh, meter attached to a crankshaft uh, with some gears that go to a totalizer. And again, every time the piston moves through a stokes a stroke cycle, just like an automobile, it will move that discrete volume uh, of the cylinder bore from the inlet to the outlet, and of course count them uh, into a totalized volume. Uh, here's a rotary vane. Uh, style meter. Again, you'll see four individual compartments in these rotary vein ones here. Uh, and these kind of work, I don't know the best analogy I can come up with, is kind of like paddling a canoe. Every time you uh, stroke the paddle through the water, you're moving a, a distinct volume. So you'll see the, the mechanics of these rotary uh, style meters are, are kind of neat where these, uh, these veins actually pull in and pull out in order to kind of scoop up these discrete volumes of fluid. And then last in the bottom right here, we have a cutaway of uh, the common uh, bellow style uh, natural gas type meter that you'd find uh, hanging on, on your house, which uh, uses differential pressure created uh, in these chambers to uh, inflate the alternating diaphragms uh, at the same time moving some sliding valves. Uh, and as that process goes through here, it's kind of like have, having a, alternating lungs. Uh, it's actually very similar, I guess you could say, to the way a heart operates. Um, I might, maybe, might not be a great example, but it's fairly similar to the way that works. So talking about all these different meters, due to the mechanical nature of these devices, several factors need to be recognized. Uh, they must have good seals. They have lots of moving parts, so they do wear out. Um, having lubrication will reduce wear. Uh, not a problem with liquid type meters. Um, there's usually uh, obviously some type of lubricating quality to a liquid, but in gas meters uh, that can be problematic. Um, if there is wear, uh, there will be something called slippage. Um, and that's just like blow by on, a, on an engine where the compressed gas makes it back into the crankcase uh, past the piston rings. Uh, same kind of idea. Um, essentially, we're getting more fluid going through the meter than is actually being uh, measured because some of it is uh, squirting in between the sides. Uh, if the mechanical components of any of these meters seize up, the flow will stop. Simple as that. Um, again, they are driven by the flow, that it, uh, the flow itself. Um, so they operate on that, and if any mechanical issues happen inside the meter and they do decide to lock up, flow will also stop as well because it has no way to uh, turn those compartments from input to output. Dirty flows, uh, of course, problematic and must be addressed before the meter. So we'll talk about things like filters and strainers and de-aerating de devices uh, that need to be installed in the piping system uh, upstream of any measuring devices. Um, they are taking individual packets of fluid, so they are immune to turbulence and swirl. So we've looked at uh, a number of different measuring devices up until this point here, and they've all had uh, all kinds of interesting numbers in terms of upstream and downstream piping requirements. Uh, and then, of course, the provision for putting in flow conditioning uh, in order to develop the flow profile to something that we want. PD meters are quite different where they really don't care. Uh, they're immune to turbulence and swirl. So again, you're grabbing a packet and moving it along. So it's, uh, I think that's a good benefit to these positive displacement type meters. Uh, and here they are linear. So linear, no piping requirement. So overall, they're, they do have a, a good spot in industry here. Uh, major difference, as I mentioned in the beginning here, the construction is different between liquid and gas meters, largely due to that molecule size. So where do we use uh, liquid PD meters? Lots of different applications, of course, depending uh, on your industry, but some examples include paints, oils, grease, fuels, chemicals in the liquid uh, flow uh, area, and in gas flow areas, you'll see them in laboratories, uh, appliance testing, standards for other devices, uh, and the most common example is natural gas at your home. So lots of different uh, applications for these types of meters. They are used uh, quite a bit for custody transfer. Um, and depending on the design, liquid or gas, uh, 
there is different applications that, that could apply. So looking at the liquid meter uh, group that we mentioned earlier, uh, mutating discs, sliding veins, reciprocating pistons, and rotating lobes of the SWAC quickly through the uh, operation uh, of these individual devices. So here we have uh, the mutating disc. And the graphic probably does more than any of the words probably do here. Uh, each rotation, uh, rotation displaces a fixed volume. This is standard for all positive displacement meters. Uh, you'll find this type of uh, meter, the mutating disc, often used for domestic water supply. So your water meter may be something like this. So uh, the cutaway doesn't really uh, do it too much justice, but you can see what's going on here as this thing kind of wobbles uh, in its housing that it uh, opens up on one side, traps that, and then as it rotates, it squirts, <laughs> basically squirts it to the output of the meter. Sliding vein. Uh, again, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time talking about them. I think you were probably all uh, fairly capable of understanding the mechanical uh, portions of these meters here. So sliding vein, as I said, has these spring-loaded veins that are mounted on this eccentric rotor. So here's that eccentric rotor that we're talking about here. Uh, again, the graphic doesn't do it much justice, but the idea here is as this uh, eccentric rotor or this cam uh, goes around and around in circles, uh, the diagram moves the chamber here around. I would have preferred to see this cam turning, but at any rate, uh, as this cam pushes on the veins, it pushes them close to the wall, and you'll see that you get a, a capture area here, uh, and it moves it over to this uh, outlet side, that allows it to go, and then those veins will retract as they go into the inlet side again, allowing it to fill, then they will close again to capture that volume, and then move it around to the outlet side again. So each rotation, uh, again, displaces a fixed volume of uh, liquid or fluid. Okay, these are widely used for uh, custody transfer applications. So here's a, a expanded version uh, of a sliding vein. This is a double case design uh, sliding vein. Um, the benefit of this one here is it distorts less easily uh, and inspection is a little bit easier, but the operating principles in terms of the mechanics inside uh, are the same as the previous example. Reciprocating piston, probably the easiest one to visualize here. Uh, each piston cycle displaces a fixed volume of liquid. The piston may have uh, two sensors, uh, which allows for better accuracy or, at, or, or half counts. Um, and I don't know, looking at this graph here, it doesn't really even show, uh, show a sensor, but if I had only one, if I only had one sensor, uh, it would only be able to count full strokes by having a sensor on each end. It will allow you to count uh, half counts. Uh, when that is uh, installed in that way, it's called double chronometry, uh, and that's fairly common in the petroleum uh, industry. Rotating lobe. Uh, those of you who are uh, gearheads, uh, this is a lot like a, a root style blower that you would find on a, on a car. Um, where we have two big, big uh, lobe style rotors, and then these, you know, can be a, a foot long or, or whatever they are, you know, a foot, two feet long in a car, about a foot long in, in industry for us. Um, but again, these uh, rotate uh, and uh, are forced by the pressure drop across the meter, sorry, uh, the pressure drop across the meter, same thing that uh, drives all the other types of meters, that pressure drop causes the lobes to turn, and as they synchronize, uh, they essentially uh, grab a volume of fluid and transfer that liquid from the high pressure side to the low pressure, uh, low pressure side. And they usually have gears connected to a totalizer that will uh, indicate the total flow. <clears throat> These are typically used for clean, vapor-free liquids. Uh, again, lots of motion here, lots of contact uh, between these lobes, so there is a requirement for uh, this device to have a particularly clean flow. So that's the general operating principles of the liquid PD meters. Uh, we'll quickly look at the gas PD meters. Uh, again, there's only a couple of different ones here. Uh, and some general uh, things that we have to consider when we're talking about gas. 
Uh, because of the dynamic, dynamic properties of gas, the seals must be uh, better than the liquid versions. Thermal expansion of parts is more of a concern when we're dealing with gas and the tighter tolerances, uh, where some thermal expansion in a liquid meter might not be too problematic. Some thermal expansion in a gas style meter could uh, push our tolerances uh, out of spec enough that we end up getting some slippage. Um, these meters are usually uh, in, um, employing some type of temperature compensation in order to compensate for uh, thermal expansion or the volume of the case, which uh, might be a little bit tough to wrap your head around, but as, uh, as the temperature warms up, uh, the volume of the case will expand uh, to some uh, minor degree. Um, but if we're using this for custody transfer, of course, we have to compensate for that. <clears throat> because most gases have no lubricating properties, mechanical wear is a bit more of a problem in the gas meters versus uh, the liquid meters. So let's look at the individual um, meters here. First, the wet gas, sometimes called the liquid sealed drum. And you'll see here, this is essentially uh, a vein style positive displacement meter here, where we have the vein uh, submerged in a liquid, as we see here, liquid sealed drum. So we have this drum uh, with some liquid in it. And the idea is that liquid acts as a seal. You probably won't see this in industry anywhere. Uh, this is usually something that's used in the laboratory uh, as, a, as a verification or a calibration standard for uh, things that we typically don't uh, necessarily deal with. So appliance testing um, is, is the application that's listed in the ILM. Again, the purpose of this water bath is to act as a seal. Second type here is rotating lobe. So here's a bit of a cutaway version of the same technology that we talked about in the liquid rotating lobe here. Um, of course, the difference is tighter tolerances. Uh, these are used for commercial and industrial gas uh, measurement applications here. So you'll see this is the uh, one of the lobes here and they can have two lobes, three lobes, and there usually be uh, two sets of these lobes that of course interact with each other. Uh, encapsulating a certain volume of flow and moving it from the inlet to the outlet. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, we have our bellows meter here. Uh, there's a picture of the gas meter on the side of someone's house. This is used for commercial and residential gas measurement. A uh, quick walkthrough of how this works. Again, differential pressure causes the gas to fill the chambers and the slide valves kind of move it along. Uh, this is actually uh, can be compared, I guess, biologically to the way to the way we breathe. Uh, we use the differential pressure created by our muscles to fill our lungs, uh, and our heart diaphragms will move that through our body. So same kind of idea uh, as, as this one fills. Here it displaces the air around it, pushes it through this chamber, which is uh, op opened by a sliding valve here that allows it to go out. And then you'll see uh, as it goes to the other cycle, it plugs off the discharge side. So the opposite side of the bellows can, can do its thing. And it just continues to do this back and forth. So uh, handy dandy kind of neat. I was told when I was in trade school that if you can uh, turn your meter, uh, swing it out from your house so it's laying horizontal, that the gas will still flow through it, but it won't count anymore. Um, but, I've never seen a piping configuration that allows you to do that. And it's probably by design. Installation for positive displacement meters here. Um, pretty general uh, installation requirements. The flow must be clean. Uh, so <laughs> filters are required if the uh, flow is dirty. They must be in a single phase, meaning that we have to remove the liquid from a gas and the gas from a liquid. And the meters should not or cannot have mechanical stress applied. Uh, to them due to the tight sealing tolerances and the potential that having stress uh, on the casing may cause some type of leakage or slippage uh, somewhere. Filters, um, again, clean flow is important, so you might have to put a filter in there. The ILM states that particle size should be uh, below 100 micrometers. Uh, the width of a single hair is about 10 to 200 micrometers, so pretty, pretty fine filtering. Uh, required for these devices, specifically uh, the gas ones, I guess, um, but I'm sure it applies to both. <clears throat> Removal of gas uh, from liquids. 
So again, uh, some type of a, a piece of equipment has to be put upstream before it hits the meters in order, uh, in order to remove liquids from gases and gases from liquids. And essentially for either application, you're going to use a vertical uh, vertical separator and really the only difference between uh, removing a gas from a liquid and a liquid from a gas is uh, where you're feeding it and where you're taking it out. So basically you could take uh, you could take this uh, separator here which is taking the gas out of the liquid and allowing the liquid to go to the bottom. Uh, if we fed it the other way we could take the gas off uh, or the liquid, the liquid off the top and then and the gas off the bottom. So uh, needless to say, the design of the, the equipment is basically the same. It's just a matter of uh, what we're taking out of it. Um, one of the problems that this vertical separator uh, handles uh, in terms of having gases or liquids mixed together is to eliminate something called overspeeding. Uh, overspeeding is a situation, uh, again, that gets caused by a liquid meter. Uh, relying on a certain density of the flowing medium to keep it spinning uh, at a certain speed. And then if we get a slug of air coming after that liquid, um, it doesn't have the same density as the liquid, so the rotor is going to slow down a little bit. And then if we get a slug of liquid coming in behind that gas, it's going to hammer it. It's going to hammer on the, on the machine and uh, cause it to go faster than it is intended to go. So that's kind of the idea behind making sure that we have proper phase isolation in our in our fluid. Here we see liquids, um, removal of liquids in a gas. So again, uh, if we looked at this process here, we're feeding, uh, feeding the liquid uh, in here. The liquids are falling out, the gases are riding, rising out to the top and we recover those vapors elsewhere and the liquid carries on uh, in a gas. Uh, liquid separator from gas, you see we feed the gas in the top, uh, the liquid flows out the bottom and the gas flows out the top. So uh, same idea, um, just depending on what you need to do. Installation, uh, we talked about support and the importance of not distorting the case of the devices that could affect the accuracy here. Uh, and you'll see some of the devices might have mounting supports uh, specifically for them in order to uh, alleviate that issue. Uh, at any rate, you want to make sure when they're installed that you're uh, you're supporting the device, uh, not using the piping system to support it. Okay, uh, upstream uh, installation requirements here, no upstream requirements. Uh, we want to ensure that we don't have mechanical or piping stresses. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't have air pockets in the flow stream because they will be counted uh, as volume. Dirty fluids, of course, could cause plugging of orifices and wear of parts. So some of these things, again, have uh, lots of mechanical components. Uh, we have to be aware of that. <clears throat> Maintenance is pretty um, pretty basic here. Uh, regular routine of lubrication and checking the tolerances are required by most manufacturers. Calibration. Uh, due to all the moving parts, there will be wear, uh, which over time will affect accuracy. Um, these meters will require periodic testing, calibration, and repair in order to maintain these close tolerances. Um, the prover will be used to calibrate a PD meter. From this, we'll get a meter factor that we can apply uh, and assign it to our meter to ensure that we have proper readings. Calibration, oh look, here's our uh, upside down drum uh, calibrator here. Uh, that we use to prove a meter. Uh, gas meters are generally proved with a bell jar prover. Liquid meters can be proved uh, by volumetric and or gravimetric standards. Um, and there's a number of different ones that you could use. Uh, I've just put piston prover in here, for example, as a volumetric prover. Okay, corrections that we have to make uh, for these types of meters, again, they're on flowing conditions here and they are subject to wear. Uh, so there's a few things we have to worry about. First, we have to compensate for slippage due to low viscosity of the fluid flow. Um, again, this is all done at operating conditions. And again, the increased viscosity or thicker fluids will have less slippage. Thinner fluids will be susceptible to more slippage, smaller molecules, right? Automatic temperature compensation is usually provided by the manufacturer. And again, this is to uh, compensate for uh, changes in the volume of the case that are related to temperature and tolerances in general. 
pressure will have little effect on the meter, uh, but keep in mind it should be kept above the liquid's vapor pressure because just like any other meter, uh, we don't want it coming in as a liquid and going out as a vapor. Um, so we want to make sure that we have proper pressure uh, in, our, in our line. Advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so excellent accuracy, 0.1%, very high rangeability. Uh, the power to drive the mechanism comes from the fluid. So again, as long as the mechanism is working good, it will flow. Uh, if it wears out or there's no flow or it jams, you will, then there will be no flow. Uh, no upstream piping requirements, but we do, again, have to be uh, very aware that the fluid must be clean. So we use strainers or filters uh, or um, deaerators. Wear of parts is a major concern, and you may have leakage error at low flow rates as a disadvantage here. Uh, can also be damaged by overspeeding or liquid hammering. So that wraps up PD meters, pretty fundamental in their, in their operation and their technology, uh, widely used in industry for a lot of different applications, and you will uh, in all likelihood have to deal with some type of PD meter uh, at some point in your career. So that is the end of today's lecture. I hope you had a wonderful time. I sure did. Uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good day.